Alright y'all, we are here for part two. What you're about to watch in actual history is a very hard chapter. Ain't nothing funny about it. But we have to know it and there's a lot to know. My job is to teach it to you while preserving our hope and our conviction for something better. So take a deep breath and just like a young Neo in the Matrix, be prepared to be empowered by the truth. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. You got it? Previously, in Proofs in the Puddin's actual history, we left off on the effective genocide of First Nations who helped and traded with encroaching colonizers. Now's the real question of history. What did those poor helpless colonizers do without people to show them how to do things? Simple. They forced more people to do things for them. Specifically farming, because remember they weren't so great at it. Specifically kidnapping some of the most slept on horticulturalists in the planet, Africans. This brings us to slavery. Not a dark period of history. It, uh... It It is American history, yeah. It's American history before America was even America history, you know. So pretty much the majority of it, you know. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, people were kidnapped from the continent of Africa, forced into slavery in the American colonies, and exploited to work because they just couldn't do their own work. You know how it works? Although for the English, that started in 1619 after the great dying of First Nations, you know, and they wiped out their help. Oops. <laughs> it actually began in this land in 1526 when the sneaking like Spanish colonizers escaping the Protestant movement came in and christened the movement with 100 enslaved Africans who then revolted, freed themselves, and like and blessfully joined First Nation people. But back to the English. From 1619 to the official founding of this country in 1776, after they freed themselves from the British, slavery was totally a thing. And of course, that included the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual torment that haunted its victims for generations. A slight side effect to being the greatest country ever. Am I right? <laughs> am I? Am I? Am I? Some of this historical trauma includes the widely practiced breeding techniques to create the master slave that would haunt African American communities for generations to this very day, in the words of historian Dr. Tony Browder. What else does generational trauma look like for African Americans? Well, let's see. What would hundreds of years of absolutely sick abuse and then denial of it from an entire country do to you? Do you know how a toxic relationship works? Make them feel worthless so that their sense of worth is wrapped around you and then gaslight them when they react? Well, welcome to the real African American history. See, enslaved Africans who worked too slowly, tried to escape, or stole from the original thieves of the land were frequently punished for expressing their God-given human rights by whipping, shackling, hanging, beating, burning, mutilation, rape, and imprisonment. They were also branded. Did you know that? They were branded to indicate ownership, much like how a dog tag worked, but branded and subjected to rape. Yeah. A document called the Willie Lynch Letter, which was later discredited as a document from the actual era, highlighted examples of the slave master tactics of breaking their slaves. While the document was not authenticated as a primary document from that era, the concept of intentional breaking an enslaved human coincides with both the well-documented intentions and practices of the so-called slave masters. But get over it, because <laughs> we was getting money! And, and by we, I mean the colonizers. Wait, cause we, didn't, we, we didn't get checks. Yeah, America was actually producing 75% of the world's cotton and creating more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley than anywhere in the nation. <laughs> yeah, enslaved workers represented Southern planters' most significant investment <laughs> and the bulk of their wealth. Anyways, as the colonizers grew richer and richer off the backs of the people they tortured and Wait, how rich? When we talk about the wealth of the South, we're talking about wealth and enslaved human beings. In fact, those enslaved human beings in the pre-Civil War period range, depending on the year, between 15 and 20 percent of the total wealth in the U.S. That means that enslaved people are worth more than all the factories, all the stocks and bonds and all the currency combined. In the 1850s, an enslaved young man about 18, 19, 20 years old in New Orleans goes for anywhere between $1,000 and $1,500. If we account for inflation, that $1,000 to $1,500 actually is equivalent to about $230 to $250,000. That's a ton of money. And of course they have to protect their investment, I mean. <laughs> and they did that in two major ways. Number one, break up any alliances being formed with other groups so as to prevent rebellions, AKA divide and rule. And two, keep Africans from educating themselves, also to prevent rebellions. Let's take a look at how that worked. Number one, Ooh, we interrupt this actual history lesson with a word from our sponsors. Hi, I'm an American lawyer. Were your ancestors objected to the intentionally untold cruelties of American slavery? Call one- Uh, uh, uh oh. Wait, okay. yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah, you uh, voted for politicians who don't actually uh, care about that. Do you support reparations for black people? Well, listen. One minute, 37 seconds later. So I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm gonna do something that's only gonna benefit black people? No. Okay, well, better luck next time, huh? And now back to your regularly scheduled program. Back to how to protect your investment, slavery edition. Divide and rule. Two major groups colonizers sought to break up from allying with their greatest investments, other white servants and indigenous people. Here's how they did it. First, a couple relevant facts about Europeans at the time. A. Indigenous European religions. Before the Roman Empire spread of Christianity, Europe was home to a profusion of religious beliefs, most of which are now pejoratively referred to as paganism. Note, this is not what people called themselves. The word derives from the Latin paganus, meaning of the countryside, essentially calling them hicks or bumpkins. These consisted of various traditional beliefs and systems, but with the politicization of religion, indigenous religions were eventually demonized and persecuted, i.e. witch hunts, the Spanish Inquisition, i.e. it is easier to control people when you can get them to believe the same thing. See the Church of England and American propaganda as examples. B. Europe was cold. In more than a couple ways. I know what you're thinking, like, duh. I know how geography works but nah i mean cold cold like from the 1500s maybe even as far back as the 1300s they were going through a little ice age no really like that's what it was called harvest slowed down birds iced up and fell from the sky men and women dying of hypothermia the king of france's beard froze solid while he slept an unprecedented arctic hurricane occurred panics and uprisings food riots and rebellions witch hunts because hey why not blame the remaining pagans for national unity european trade started getting desperate and brutal and turned into global robbery desperate times make desperate people C. I know we're told these really romantic tales of fancy schmancy renaissance artists and thinkers and before that European kings and knights and before that royal emperors. Yeah, yeah. Forget what you heard. The majority of Europe was not them. They were po white folks. Po white people. Farmers. To their, to their credit, so were pretty much all fundamental societies of the world from ancient Kemet to the Mayans and Mexica, aka Aztecs. I mean, after all, farming is life, you know? Yeah, but not. This year was different. Here, they actually legit dogged out their farmers. In Britain, they had this enclosure system, aka eminent domain, where elite rulers could snatch up the land you were living on if they felt like it because you had like no hope of ever owning or truly claiming the land you lived on. This left their peasants, as they were called, the dishes broke, desperate and crowding into the towns, unemployed, unproductive, and unwanted. At least till urban industry required them. Until then, desperate and neglected by their rulers, they largely fell to crime and the British essentially wanted them out. By the late 1700s, England had more than 200 crimes punishable by death. I said death. Something African rulers could not even fathom. So when England heard of the New World, they happily sent out their poor neglected folk. In fact, more than half the colonizers that came to America were of this class and specifically sent as indentured servants to serve off their prison time, basically. They were even sold the dream of owning land at the end of their servitude, which few actually ended up rising to any prosperity in this way. Their ship rides were horrendous and when they got here were beaten for the pettiest of things, raped and constantly told they were inferior. That is until African slavery began and they started getting friendly with the Africans, even starting families and rebelling with them. So slave masters had to devise a plan to stop them from getting in the way of taking away their most prized MVPs. So they gave them guns, gave them less, harsher sentences, remind them of the land they were promised to own and convince them of their superiority over the indigenous and Africans. Slave patrols were established in Virginia to deal with the great dangers that may happen by the insurrection of Negroes. Poor white men would be recruited for the rank and files of these patrols for a monetary reward. Implementing racism was becoming more and more of a practical strategy. And so it was, as social scientist Paulo Freire claimed, that the oppressed were socially engineered to become the oppressors, an unfortunate law of humans that, unless conscious of the trick, many have fallen for. So where are they now? Uh, as Trump country. No, but for real, fast forward to 1948, politicians would begin to recruit this generationally engineered racist white citizen black into the Republican Party by appealing to their engineered disdain for African Americans. This, my friends, was called the Southern Strategy. It's a real thing. Now, the indigenous. The indigenous people were notorious for harboring runaway po white folk and Africans. Absolutely terrible. Hector Saint Jean Crevoque, the Frenchman who lived in America for almost 20 years, told in letters from an American farmer how white children captured during the Seven Years' War with natives would refuse to leave their new families. There must be in their social bond, he said, something singularly captivating and far superior to anything to be boasted among us. For thousands of Europeans are now. Indians, and we have no examples of even one of those Aborigines having from choice become Europeans. 
Africans also ran away to native villages. And the Creeks and Cherokees harbored runaway enslaved Africans by the hundreds. Many of these hundreds were amalgamated into native tribes, married, and produced children. Hence, native heritage to this day in many African Americans. Well, the slave masters could not just stand by and watch this love and unity occur freely. No. Governor Littleton of South Carolina wrote in 1738, It has always been the policy of this government to create an aversion in them, Indians, to Negroes. And so laws were passed prohibiting free blacks from traveling in Indian country. Treaties with Indian tribes contain clauses requiring the return of fugitive slaves. Part of this policy involved using African slaves in the South Carolina militia to fight natives. Also, the combination of harsh slave codes and bribes to the natives to help put down African rebels kept things under control. To this very day, First Nation communities are divided among folks who remember this original unity or folks who fell for the traps of divide and rule. And it is painful to take in. What's also painful is hearing ignorance like this. Slavery for 400 years? For 400 years? That sounds like a choice. Well, that's interesting, Kanye, because outside of being outgunned and in a country full of diehard racists and killers, <laughs> with all the odds and once allies stacked against them in this chessboard of their lives, African Americans still risked it all for freedom. So now, let's look at the legacy of African resistance in this country. Coming up next in part two of the actual history of the United States and African Americans. We made it on the other side. How's the truth sinking in? You see all the pieces connecting. Big ups to the historians who weren't afraid to tell the truth and the witness accounts who left us their testimonies. As always, your donations help to keep this project alive. And as always, let the truth empower you. I'm Prashona Embree. Peace, love, light, and truth.